So let's look at the Carmichael coal mine. It's a massive mine that's proposed for central Queensland, inland from Mackay. So if we look at a map, you can see Mackay there on the east coast. You go inland, you can see the project marked. Um, the project's actually proposing to take the coal out by a new rail line um, out at Abbott Point, um, which is just near Bowen. So the project, if we focus in on it, um, is shown in pink purple there. That's the mining lease area. And um, on this image, there's the um, current pasture leases that are in the area. So Dumabulla is a big pasture lease um, to the west. There's Carmichael. Um, Moray Downs is the pasture lease that it's mainly on. There's Lingnab, Lignum and Melaleuca to the south. Um, the Carmichael River passes through the mine site and just to the west of it, there's a big springs complex that I'll talk about in a moment, the Dungmabula Springs Complex, which is groundwater fed. So if we focus in on the mine layout plan, this mine is enormous. It's about 20, this image that I'm showing you is about 20 kilometres across by about 30 kilometres north to south. Um, there's n the pits within it um, will be like four kilometres by four kilometres across. So there's pit pits A through to P um, so the green stippled squares are the open cut pits and the um, what look like louvers or something here, that, that's underground um, mining in, in that area. The coal seams dip um, from east to west, they go deeper. So they start with open cut on the eastern side and then once it gets too deep to be economically viable, they go underground. So. Here's an open cut concept, you know, you strip away the whole overburden. Um, so if you look at this bottom one here, you've got a big drag line, there's, you take away the overburden and you dig down to the coal seams. And this is an example of an open cut mine uh, in the Bowen Basin. So you can see the overburden up here and they've gotten right down to the coal seams. <coughs> This is another example from a mine in the Galilee Basin or an, uh, a test pit for a mine in the Galilee Basin called the Alpha Mine and you can clearly see here the overburden and then the coal seams in black. Okay, so once you go underground, you don't need to take off the overburden but basically you go along and um, long wall mining, which is what's proposed, basically moves along and takes out the coal and then the ground collapses beneath it so the subsidence um, of the ground above, so there's a drop of um, six to six metres or so um, because that's essentially the coal seam that they're taking out. Now once they've got the coal out of the ground, it's then trans proposed to be transported by a massive new rail line to the coast and the rail line is one of the big difficulties for the project because it's very expensive and capital intensive to build and you've got to put that in up front. Um, once it gets to the coast, uh, it's going to Abbott Point. So this is the current coal loading facility at Abbott Point. It's massive already. The coal is deposited from um, the trains in a stockpile and then goes out on a conveyor belt out to the deeper water where the um, berths are for the ships and then loaded onto ships. Now, because of the massive increases in coal that were proposed about five years ago, there, was, there were a number of proposals to expand the um, Abbott Point. Um, so currently there's one terminal T1, there was a proposal for a multi-cargo facility um, and then there are proposals for other different um, terminals. T0 is the Adani one. Most of the others have dropped away because the coal market has died and only Adani is really pushing ahead with a proposal to expand Abbott Point. It's having a lot of troubles with both the dredging for it but also where you get rid of the dredge spoil for that terminal and whether it, it was originally proposed to dump it in the Grab Barrier Reef, ultimately that was junked and it's proposed to dispose of it um, on land or for reclamation. Now the enormous scale of coal mines is really difficult to understand, um, especially the new mega mines like Carmichael. So this mine, as I said, was about 20 kilometres across, 25 kilometres across and about 30 kilometres north to south. To give you some idea of the scale of that, so you know, University of Queensland is one kilometre across. If you took a four by four square, then you would take out the whole of St Lucia, 
over to pretty well the Gabba, all of West End, the CBD, Orkinflower, Tawong. Imagine digging that area and going down like 100, 150 metres. So that would be an enormous hole. Who lives in that square? I live in that square. So we're all 100 metres underground. And if you took the whole of the pits, they're about 8 kilometres wide by about 32 kilometres long, you'd have an area, that, a pit, that would stretch from UQ to Redcliffe. Eight kilometres across, 100 metres deep. Absolutely enormous. And um, I'm just going to stretch the mine across Brisbane just to show you. That was obviously a block. But if you just take, I've just got a scale there of four kilometres and stretch the actual mine layout across it, it would stretch basically from Logan home all the way through to Chermside. So basically all through Brisbane, pretty well you take out a million people in that area. So who lives in that mine area? If, if, um, yep, so pretty well everyone here is going to live in that footprint. Absolutely enormous amount of dirt that is going to be moved. Apart from the coal that is going to be pulled out of the ground, the overburden that actually gets moved for this mine is phenomenal. It is virtually incomprehensible how big the hole is. Now, I want to talk about the impacts. I'm going to focus on three things. Um, groundwater, um, a bird species, an endangered bird species that's on the mine site, and also climate change. So let's talk about groundwater. Um, the groundwater impacts of, of, for this mine really focus on Dugmabulla Springs, which are off to the west of the mine site. Um, so the mustard there, the mustard shape is the mine, mining lease area. The pink are other mining, mine proposals or exploration permits. So Dungmabula Springs um, is east and it's not actually on the mining lease area. But because of the way the groundwater flows, um, there's a real concern that Dungmabula Springs will be heavily impacted. So um, if you focus in, um, the Dungmabula Springs is a complex of groundwater springs, there's about 60 of them, and they're scattered around the Carmichael River but they're not associated with surface flow. It's water that's coming up from the ground, has been for tens of thousands of years. Tens of thousands of years. Um, if we have a look at some of the springs, this is um, a screenshot from a video I'm going to show you from Moses Three Lagoon. The big lake that you can see in the foreground is both fed by groundwater and surface water, but it looks spectacular. But actually the outlet for the groundwater springs is over here, this big bunch of trees. So this is some footage from a drone flying up over that lake. And you can see the, the lake in the middle of that screen. You can see the outlet for the springs in the distance coming into view now. And the outlet footage is having a bit of difficulty playing, but you can get the basic idea. Can you see that the big outlet, bright green, so water has been flowing out at exactly that point for tens of thousands of years. You can, if you walk in there, and I've walked into it a couple of times, there's these big melaleuca trees and um, it's not actually the melaleucas and the trees that are a really exciting thing from an ecological perspective. It's actually a lot of the grasses and sedges um, that are growing around the base of the um, trees that are really exciting from an ecological perspective because they're endemic to groundwater springs. They're um, found nowhere else, obviously, and, um, and they have been heavily impacted by development of springs around um, Queensland. So this is one of the jewels in the crown of groundwater springs in Queensland. So this is just a picture of Moses Three Lagoon. Um, yeah, heaps of bird life there. Like as I said, I've been there a couple of times. Huge number of birds. Yeah, lots of stuff going on there. Permanent water. So in central Queensland, that's you know um, more valuable than gold and diamonds and everything else you could throw at it. Particularly from an ecological perspective. So this is another of the springs, which is just a little way away. Um, this one looks much like a big um, golf course, more than the, there's no big trees growing on it. Again, water has been coming up here for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years. And this is um, another bit of drone imagery. 
that will rise up and then look over um, what's called Moses 1 um, Lagoon. So it turns around and it'll follow the creek around. And what I want you to notice is in the distance how dry it is. So it's all cattle country. It's a, it's a working cattle property, but cattle haven't impacted heavily on the springs. They don't really walk into the springs. Um, and these springs aren't heavily impacted by weeds, amazingly. And this swings back. That's the Moses 1 lagoon directly down. You can see how different it is to what's in the distance. So, and you can see um, the other Moses um, the imagery I just showed you just in the distance. So these are really amazing springs. This is another one, Little Moses Spring. This one's quite different. It's to the east. It's quite heavily impacted by weeds. Um, it's quite a different nature to the others. And then there's Joshua Spring, which is an artesian spring that flows without pumping out of the ground. Now, farmers decades ago had built a dam around the spring, so it would have flowed out to the ground before and back down to the Carmichael River. But they built a dam around it, and this is now an outlet coming out from the dam that's just been, um, the water's just flowing out. But there's nothing pumping that. You can see the solar panels in the background, but that's not associated with a pump for the water coming out of the ground. So water's just rising up out of the ground and coming out at a phenomenal rate. Um, and so an artesian spring occurs where you have water being recharged, um, getting into a groundwater system, and then a confining layer that stops the water getting back out. And then the water is, flows to a point, and then if you put a well down to that water and your groundwater level is lower than the hydraulic head in the recharge area, water will flow out of a well. Or alternatively, alternative, alternatively, if it's a natural artesian spring, a fault is typically what causes basically a break through a confining layer uh, get, and allows the water to get to the surface. But it's the hydraulic head from the recharge area that drives the water out of the ground. So in the assessment of this mine, a critical issue was whether the source of the springs is from above or beneath a regional aquitard, so a confining layer, called the Rewind Formation. And one thing that Adani, the mining company, claimed was that there's no evidence of any faulting in the area of the Dungabula Springs, but, it's a significant but, they actually didn't do any testing, drilling, seismic testing for faults in the area around Dungabula Springs specifically. They did a lot on their mine site because faults are really significant if you're planning to construct a big mine. And on their mine site, this is some of the seismic data, the red line is a fault and it actually goes from 550 metres depth through to about 200, met 200 metres beneath the surface of the ground. So that's a fault running hundreds of metres. Um, the black lines here are the coal seams and the rewind formation is directly above it. So you've got a fault going through the rewind formation on their mine site to the east, but their claim was, hey, no evidence of faulting at the springs itself. But it's very much a false claim because, well, it's true but misleading because there was the, they hadn't done any testing for faulting, so um, saying there's no evidence is like claiming that, uh, well, think of an appropriate analogy, but you get the idea. You've got faulting on the mine site that goes all the way through the rewind formation. It's a logical inference that there may well be faulting going through the rewind formation at the springs, and that would be a logical source for the springs. Um, in the approval process, ultimately, um, the government decided that it couldn't really work out where the springs were. The federal minister came up with a fantastic idea of doing a study for the source or the Rewind Formation Conductivity Research Plan. This is in the federal approval for the mine. And basically, there has to be, it wasn't done before in terms of the assessment of the mine. The minister says there must be a plan to assess the connectivity across the Rewind and it must be, the plan must be submitted three months before mining commences. But no actual, you don't actually have to have the results. So they haven't done the testing for the faulting and they're allowed to get the approval and do the testing in the future. And if the mine does basically, if the, there is a fault that allows the groundwater is coming from beneath the rewind, 
then that's where the mine is going to dewater because that's where the coal seams are. <coughs> and so basically the Dungabula Springs will just stop. Stop, end of story, can't be restarted, faults will likely close, you can't restart it, completely stuffed. So groundwater springs that have been there for tens of thousands of years, gone, overnight. And yeah, get the, the logic of assess whether they're there after you've given the approval. Okay, in terms of threatened species, um, it just gets better um, because um, this mine ticks boxes for every conceivable big picture thing that you could have. So apart from these amazing springs complexes with all these endemic species that may well be just wiped out completely, um, on the mine site itself, where they plan to mine, the habitat looks like this. So I've just got some imagery from one of the parts of the um, EIS. And um, it doesn't look like much, does it? You know, cattle property you know, looks fairly impacted. Um, we were, these pictures are taken in a fairly dry time. It's often really dry. But on that, um, in that area, there's this amazing little bird called the black-throated finch. Um, this is an, an image of it. Um, and you can see how big they are. This is a picture. You can see the size of the hand. So if you hold up your hand and you imagine a little finch on your fingers, it'd just be, you know, basically the size of your fingers. So a really cool little bird. This is also a close-up. You can see the finger just underneath it where the, on the picture. So they're not really as ginormous as it might appear from that picture. Okay, this is a picture taken where the mine is going to go. Um, it was a, it's a picture with 124 black-throated finches in it, part of a flock of at least 400 black-throated finches which were observed by a PhD student who Adani let onto the property. Now they hadn't been finding many, they had not been finding many black-throated finches on the property and he just happened to wander across a flock of 400, which is the largest flock of these birds ever observed, ever. Well, of course I'm referring to um, post-European invasion and what we record in pictures. Um, I'm sure that pre-invasion um, and Aboriginal people have observed larger flocks, but in terms of um, records, um, photographic records, um, this is the largest ever. And this is observed in 2013, so not very long ago, in the midst of the approval. Didn't really get much of a mention in the EIS. Um, funnily that, they, the, um, this is part of the um, environmental assessment, the EIS, Environmental Impact Statement for the mine. And basically it turns out Although it wasn't acknowledged in the EIS, but what came out in the court case that I was involved in last year in the land court, what came out was that the population of black-throated finch on the mine site is the largest population left of two. There's another large population west of Townsville, but this is the largest, and this population is critical for the species survival. So basically this um, uh, diagram shows basically the size of populations that were observed. So the big circles represent the big populations. The different colours represent different years. So the red was the um, BTF abundance in 2011, blue is BTF abundance in 2012, and yellow is BTF abundance in 2013. So you can see they're pretty consistently around this northern section, which is basically where a big part of the mine is to go, around a place called um, Ten Mile Bore, which is I've been there, it's basically just a big bore that's been pumped out to this permanent water. Um, we're not really sure why the black-throated finch is there. We're not really certain about its habitat preferences, why it's there, why it's not in the areas around the mine. So notice that there are some small populations, um, and down here there's a population, but basically they're all within the mine site. Um, interestingly, um, in the EIS, so this middle column is BTF records that were reported by the miner in the environmental impact statement. And notice that there's about a thousand, but no big flocks. During the records that came to light through the court process last year, um, another thousand records were located, including flocks of over 50 and flocks of over 100. So notice there's none of that in the actual environmental impact study. Um, now what's proposed, because the mine's going ahead, the government says 
you know. You've got to address the impacts on the black-throated finch. So what the miner proposes to do is establish offsets somewhere outside the mine. They haven't actually identified the exact locations yet, but somewhere within these hatched areas, they're going to provide offsets for black-throated finch habitat, which will be lost due to the mine. Now, you might just remind yourself about how many black-throated finch there are in those areas right now and the fact that we really don't know why they're not there and why they're on the mine site. And then you think, well, what are you going to do in the offset areas? They're not there now. Why would the birds go there? If they're not there now, why would you just assume that what's good on the mine site you can replicate when you don't know why they're on the mine site? And you might think, well, that's kind of a problem for um, offsets that actually make sense. Um, and if you get involved in this sort of process, you realise that offsets don't really have to make a lot of sense. They just have to be there for a veneer of, yes, we're addressing that impact um, and we're going to offset it. So um, it's all smoke and mirror stuff. OK, then we get to climate change. You might think, big coal mine, going to be burnt, climate change implications. Um, yes, um, this mine will be the biggest coal mine in Australia, one of the biggest in the world absolutely enormous amount of coal that will be pulled out of the ground. 40 to 60 million tonnes of thermal coal per year. Um, to give you the context, there's 50 mines in, in Queensland at the moment. Combined, they produce about 200 million tonnes. So this one mine is going to massively increase production from Queensland, which as you know, Queensland is one of the biggest coal producers in the world. Um, emissions. The, mine, the greenhouse emissions associated with the mining itself, the direct emissions, are very small relatively, only about 2% of the total. Over the 30 to 60 year life of the mine, the coal will produce about 2.3 billion tonnes of thermal coal. When you burn that, you end up with about 4.7 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases. They're called scope 3 emissions in greenhouse reporting terminology. That's about 98% of the total emissions associated with this mine. And there's a thing called the carbon budget, which is an idea that's been around for the last eight years or so um, from a series of papers in um, um, the journal Nature and it's been adopted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This idea that to keep global temperature rises beneath two degrees, there is only a certain amount of carbon from fossil fuels that we can emit because basically once the carbon goes into the atmosphere it's there basically forever pretty well a thousand years um, so um, once you burn it it's there forever so there's a total budget that we've got this one mine the coal from it represent 0.6 of a percent of the entire globe's remaining budget forever technically out to 2050 but basically forever so one mine represents 0.6 of a percent of the entire globe's emission budget. You might think that that was significant. Um, but in fact, in the EIS process, it pretty well got ignored. For years in Queensland and at a Commonwealth level, we've just had this tacit agreement between government and miners that we ignore the burning of the coal overseas. So if you look at that on a graph, um, we've happily assessed the emissions associated with the mining itself, but that's just this small wedge. And ignored, we've ignored the 98% of emissions associated with the burning of the coal. So for, the, in, for this mine, which had a massive EIS, there was no information about the scope 3 emissions, the emissions from the burning of the coal wasn't assessed. The Queensland government argues that these emissions are not relevant to the assessment of a mine in Queensland. Um, so the Queensland Department of Environment Heritage Protection will, that's their argument, not relevant, we don't have to consider it because the mine's going to be exported, they'll be burned overseas. You might say to them, well, you know, the globe has one atmosphere. So surely if the coal is going to be burnt, wherever in the world it's burnt, it's going to impact our atmosphere and impact us. So it might be a good idea to think about it. But no, their response is not relevant. So our current approach is pretty well like this. You put your fingers in your ear, you go as loud as you can, la, 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 can't hear you, climate change. Or to put this another way, um, for environmental impact assessment in Queensland for coal mines, it's pretty well like this. 
We look at groundwater, threatened species and the like. We look at the direct emissions from mining. We ignore the burning of the coal. And it's, yeah, I like this cartoon. The elephant in the room for our coal mines is climate change, but we ignore it. Okay, great question. Um, scope 1, 2 and 3, where does it come from? Why do they ignore it? So um, it comes from an international reporting framework. We'll talk more about it when we talk about climate change in lecture 11, I think. Um, so scope 1, um, for about the last decade, um, scope 1 emissions are emissions directly associated with an activity. So when you turn on your car, you've got your burning fuel, assuming you don't have an electric vehicle. Um, you're burning fuel and out of your tailpipe is coming um, uh, carbon dioxide emissions and a few other things. So you have direct greenhouse emissions from your activity. So on a mine site, the diesel going into trucks um, the, uh, and fugitive emissions. So when you rip up the coal, quite a bit of methane comes out of the coal seams. So that's like coal seam gas, but you're not capturing it. So there's a lot of fugitive emissions. So those are direct emissions from the activity. They're called scope one. Scope two is emissions associated with your use of electricity generated somewhere else. So in this room, we're using electricity. Let's just assume it's not coming from solar. It's coming from a coal-fired power generator. So the electricity that we're using in this room has scope two emissions, um, but we don't actually see them in this room. And so those are the direct and indirect with an activity scope three are indirect but either upstream or downstream emissions. So um, particularly for a large resources project, you dig up the coal, you sell it, someone else burns it, you can regard that as a scope three emission. It's just an accounting framework. Uh, under the international reporting framework, Australia only reports direct emissions from within Australia. We don't report coal or gas or petroleum that we export to say China, which is burned in China. China reports that. So we then use that framework to say, well, we don't have to report scope three emissions or assess them for a coal mine. But the reality is if you've got an environmental impact assessment of a coal mine, there are going to be these emissions and they will impact the atmosphere. So if you ignore them, it's like you're ignoring the elephant in the room. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so in terms of the expected condition of the Great Barrier Reef, um, Basically, we know that the reef is being heavily impacted now. We've got about one degree mean global temperature rise. We're at about 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right now. The reef, um, this is from a paper by Ophir Goldberg um, and colleagues from 2007 in the journal Science. They put together three images of what they think coral reefs will look like under different climate scenarios. So on the left is reef <coughs> as it is now, actually being impacted but still relatively healthy. If we keep going, not very much further, but up to 4, 450 to 500 parts per million CO2, and bear in mind we're at 400 parts per million now and going up by 2 to 3 parts per million a year. So we're, you're looking, you know, in your working lives, we'll be at that level on current emission rates. And 2 degree warming, the reef's pretty well stuffed. Weedy. If you go above 3 degrees, reef's completely obliterated. So that's what we think will happen to reefs. That's the best science. Um, and yeah, I, I just mentioned now, you, you would have heard a lot about the um, Paris Accord or the Paris Agreement last year about stabilising temperature rises and a lot of hoo-ha about the two degree target. So basically I just point out that even if we're successful in stabilising temperatures beneath two degrees, we won't have a Great Barrier Reef. That's what the science is saying. So don't get too enthusiastic about stabilising beneath two degrees. To me it's like, yeah, it's a crazy target, but it's internationally that there, there's, we're stabilizing, aiming to stabilize beneath two degrees or, um, at, or beneath 1.5 degrees is a new target that's come in. But even at 1.5, the reef will be heavily impacted. We're seeing it now. We're seeing it at one degree. We've got massive coral bleaching occurring right now. Why would you think that you could double the temperature from what we've got now and it would be okay? Okay, in terms of economics, um, the mine got into at least some public relations bother because when you weigh up, what we'll see is when you weigh up a big mine like this, there aren't really any specific criteria. It's basically a big weighing up process. 
So you weigh up, say, if you're going to lose the Dungamugula springs, if you're going to lose a threatened species, if you're going to you know, cause harm due to climate change. Those are all negatives. And then the positive in terms of approving this mine is jobs and money that we get from it. So the economics. So the miner, it's in the miner's interest to inflate those claims, and inflate they did. Um, they were running ads at the last election about how Adani would generate 10,000 jobs and $22 billion in royalties. Um, I'll point out at the end of the lecture that those turned out to be bunkum. Um, and in the court process last year, their own expert um, walked away from it and said that it was more like 1,400 jobs net across Australia. And um, instead of $22 billion, it was more like 3 to $5 billion in net present value. Now, you might say, well, 1,500 jobs is still significant and $5 billion is still a fair bit of um, royalties. But the comparison is what they're claiming and what the, even their own expert agreed to. So, um, and with the economics, I'll leave economics, come back to, come back to it. So, um, people involved, Adani is an Indian um, multinational company. Um, it's the Adani family established it. Guthrum Adani is the chairman. Um, they're in Australia, Indonesia, but mainly in India. Um, people opposed to it, lots of people opposed to it. You might have been to a rally for it. So this was a group of lawyers and, and um, a conservationist who I worked on the case, uh, several cases about it with. So um, you can see me there. This is out at Dungabula Springs. Um, Winita Williams, um, Sean Ryan from the Environmental Defender's Office, Saul Holt, um, QC, an amazing um, silk. Um, and Derek Davies here, um, a conservationist who was um, the lead person for organising essentially the objections and running the court case from a conservation sector. You can read about the court case on my website. There's a heaps of documents there um, on groundwater, on uh, yeah, climate change. I've put up all of the expert reports, so you'll see that there is an enormous amount of information. Our closing submissions for the land court case last year were 210 pages long. So. Um, a lot of stuff there. I think there were over a thousand footnotes. So basically a PhD in the submissions. 